following is a case interview with Mr. John Barkey, international representative of the United Automobile Workers, and LaRue Leonard, retired member of Local 287 and also former representative of the United Automobile Workers. Gentlemen, the tape will be put on reserve at uh, Ball State University, and it will serve the community and uh, the university in the future as a source of primary reference for students and scholars interested in the history of the labor union movement and in the Muskie community. It's uh, a great privilege for me to uh, be able to interview two gentlemen so, so distinguished in the labor movement who have made such uh, outstanding contributions, uh, both directly for Local 287 and also for the uh, UAW uh, throughout the country. Suppose we begin uh, with you, uh, Mr. Leonard. Let us ask to begin with, when did you first become concerned with the organization of Local 287? Well, Danny, the first uh, activities that I became aware of were people wanting to move in the city of Muncie was shortly after the NRA had been uh, enacted into a law, which gave some minor protection. But at that time, was a major protection to working people in regard to their relationship with employers. About this time, the AFL Council in the city of Monthly had assigned a committee to work to develop further organization of their organization in the area. The leadership of this group best reflected in the main cry of the Molders Union and Clark Johnson from the Typographic Union and and other people in connection with the state office of the Secretary of Labor of the City of the Anatolian Organization of the Australian World. They set up a committee to organize. In the efforts of Mr. Fry, meetings were called of interested persons in the labor movement to establish such an organization. Meetings were over on the And Ralph Fisher was the man who contacted me in the old time last week. This time we have been drafted. And from this hardcore of grassroots, which we have been displaced by automation in the last time, 23 months, was a new group to attempt organization of the AFL. Another fellow by the name of Fisher was active. I can't recall his first name, but they were no relation. And two of these men were in a sense under scrutiny of this charge of made by the company over one thing or another that I cannot recollect at this time. And the cases have been fired down in the mountain before the process made it down. Uh, the individual one that placed me. Now, was that uh, before Local 287 was organized? It was just prior. This the year 1934 35 that activity started. <laughs> now, was there a union that morning here at the time? Oh, there was no union that morning here at the time. But the company immediately set up an independent. And I'd say it was 98% of the employees who were here in the neighborhood somewhere around. Uh, about 1,200 people were brought into the company's room. And uh, we call it something that we had another name for it, but that's the Employees Association. Employees Association. So a few of us didn't join the company's organized group, and uh, several uh, were threatened. Uh, but no discharge was made because the business action of the lawsuit was 
involving Shakespeare and some others in uh, 1934. 1935, we finally lost out because of the inability of the Adolf Frick, who sent a labor to answer certain correspondence to individual members, and when they did send help in to help us organize, but uh, it was just too late to jump in and set up an employee association. So, then it, it was an effort, uh, an honest effort on the part of the elected representatives out of this company, and for the workers. There was some small benefit, very minor uh, benefit, just really there, but nothing like job security or vacation or security.
Mormon Canyon and McQueen Arm. And then I, I was appointed a director of Indiana by Hall Martin. He was the president of the right. W.S.A. Right. Missouri. Oh, Missouri. Yes. Yes. He was in Kansas City also. <laughs> okay. Uh, and yes, Baptist right. Reader, right. Born in August. Born in August 16th. Right. I don't know about that. Uh, but uh, then uh, I had to sort of take responsibility for the organization of the work of the state. And I was in Anderson with a big union meeting one day, and the workers from Warner Gear got in touch with me and asked for some cars. So they could start over. So I gave them the cars, the month's end of car parts in the room, and it was the office, and I keep thinking, remember who else. But uh, they did approach you, right? Yes, the other way that's right. They approached me to, uh, to uh, get the cards so they could start their organization. After I got out of the meeting in Anderson. So they, they started their organization and they uh, uh, really made good in their organization efforts. I came over and spoke to them on, on a number of occasions at the city farm. And then, of course, I serviced their local union. Why the city farm? I suspect that was the only place they could get to me at that time. Uh, and and uh, they, they completed their organization, or affected their organization, and then I serviced the local youth uh, considerably after that. We saw them make progress in the wages, uh, bettering the working conditions, and having the union procedure just gave them industrial democracy. You know? And of course, the word industrial democracy is, as you know, encompasses everything that goes with it. Proper word for uh, the organization of, uh, of work, bringing to them industrial democracy, which means that it isn't that effective, say, in the local and work conditions. And then uh, I became um, secretary of the state CIO in 1938. Then, of course, my obligation was still to lobby in the legislature for legislation. To uh, 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 help get good representation of people like this, this conference from the United States and Britain to it again, and, and organize council, and then finally we got Slater's nonpartisan. And the rule letters from the local 287 was elected secretary of Slater's nonpartisan. And he and I then worked together in the lobbying for legislation and getting good people elected to the Congress and the Senate of the United States. Then I uh, I did it in Moscow, the secretary of the state of Moscow. Well, uh, probably he had nothing to do with that. No, I was with John all the way. Oh, you never was with him. <laughs> and then I went back to Cuba for three and a half years. Then in 1947, I came back out of the international representative. I've done the international representative with UAW every time. I've attended every one of our conventions from 1935 all the way through to the last in 1968. And so I, I've seen our organization grow. So I might point out that when I was first put on the staff as a representative, the International Union did not have enough money to pay me. I was paid by the few that was organizing the committee, and that money came from donations of the other unions that finally formed the CIO. All right, I'd have to come back later, uh, John, and talk to you more about some of the things that happened that you have seen happen in the International Union during the past several years. It's something extremely interesting. And uh, I opened the uh, culminating chapter of the book that I'm working on to uh, include uh, these uh, developments and also uh, possibly to uh, reflect a little bit on uh, what direction the labor movement may be heading at the present time. So uh, I do want to come back to that point later. Yes, in addition to uh, being a delegate to our national convention, Lou and I were delegates to the merger convention of the FLCO in New York City in 1955. I know, of course, uh, the UAW has grown out officially from the uh, the AFL CLO. That's right. Let me believe. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later too. And let, let me come back to you and look at you uh, if I may. Uh, you seem to be uh, one of the few people uh, still available uh, with uh, uh, keen memories uh, who are active in organizing over 287. 
Why did you and uh, your colleagues contact uh, John Barkey back in 1937? We contacted not only John Barkey, but Hugh Thompson and uh, some of our people met with Victor Luther and Bob Parker, Robert Truman, who was the old radio crew, because he had the church on the coast of our organization. Which is uh, very hard to find people who uh, take on that kind of responsibility and do the past activities uh, where labor has been taken out to the other side. So, the reasons were very simple. In 19, under the company union, uh, we were brought together by the company. The same as the other plants in the castle and hand brought together in their respective communities by their master. Saying to us that we had to take a reduction in wages and percent in 1937, 36, 36 and so on. Then we took these reductions on the promise that as soon as they could, they'd re reinstate the uh, uh, wage structure. was that Newcastle and what we stored their 10 percent gave the board a $25 bonus. Anderson, Del Florini, General Motors Plant, reinstated their wage cut and gave some benefits in addition to that. Uh, water here was still down on the totem pole. So the company union restaurant, we some of the old glass that we've ever heard before, began to say, why don't want it here? We state their next step back. So some of us got to the union restaurant, independent union restaurant, and uh, took the question before the company. Well, we didn't get too much encouragement to do that. So, I and a few others decided that we'd take the group leaders of our plan and ask for a meeting with the company union representatives and the management representatives and uh, talk to the different. Well, after this type of plotting, the meeting was held, and no, uh, no animosity was built up. Were the group leaders uh, elected by the workers, or were they appointed by the company? The group leaders at that time were appointed to the company, but the greater number of those group leaders were men who had had good mechanical ability, and to this, they had been able to, the company kicked down and paid them a few pennies more on the hour, to guide the direct the activities of a group. In my group, there was about 20 people. And so, this group uh, was not the rank and file, but it was uh, a part of, you might say, not at that time. Uh, 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 Coupling up with the independent union people, backing them up for their street restoration cut. The result was, uh, yeah, we had to work. We were taken off today, and we worked one shift in plant two. That was 3 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night. The reason this was, it kept the electric current bill down at an even peak. If you know what a meter reads, it goes up and down and valley and so forth and so on. But by operating portions of the plant on days and portions of the plant on night, in separate buildings, you can keep the current rate down and get some space in the company. Though we could understand some of this thing that was brought out to us. Well, shortly after this meeting, a uh, week and ten days, uh, I was at my machine one night. The president of the corporation came in, and uh, they had a strict rule of no smoking in the plant. If you got caught smoking, you were fired. You were the captain. Captain, Jack Jackson, Jackson, you've had the right. 
with the president and uh, George Hunter was the uh, uh, general uh, superintendent. Under him was Oscar Moore. And the nice superintendent was Charlie Clark, a very fine fellow. But he's strictly against you. But he's a nice fellow. So the result was that when Jack came in that night, he, I was operating the chanters in the window, and I spoke on the mail on the wall, and he smoked a cigarette. So I was to good humor. I just still left my hands off, and he showed him my jacket and got a cigarette and lit it. He stood there all watching me, just fine. I never said a word. And then he grinned at me. Well, I figured, well, this is it. So I was going to be in the group of leaders, of course. And they came about not getting the money back. I thought, well, this is what it got me. So I might as well enjoy it. And I had a smoke. I, and when he put his cigarette on, I put mine on. And he said, it works for me about smoking. And uh, I stood there and watched him for about 20, 25 minutes. And went away. I never said one word, but I'm sure that I'm going to get my time. So some time came, but time was no better. The next evening, I'm working, and uh, Charlie Clark, the night nice people came around and said, Well, you're going to get your sense of set back, so I got a boat. How do you feel about that? Well, Charlie, how would you feel if something gave you twenty five dollars? You feel pretty good too. Well, I feel pretty good because I haven't had twenty five dollars to do anything with for so long. How do you twenty five cents? Well, I'm happy. But that don't settle it, Charlie. So, nothing more was said, we went along, so finally we were in great. 1935, Carl Parker, Harold Snyder, George uh, Patterson, people in the dead, George Patterson, Carl Parker, so Carl Parker passed on to about a year or so ago. Now, <clears throat> these men, had, uh, Patterson had a brother in law named Fox, the land that was organized. He recalled that time when fake news was brought into the picture and they were assembled in the Alexandra and, and uh, Alma Davis was living in Alexandra. Uh, Alma Davis was contacted by the city. Robertson was on the name and he was organized in the UAW and he was in Ohio. White motor. Then <clears throat> Merrill Snyder, who had a little bit better than average education, and uh, several others, Mr. Ray, uh, Alex Babbitt, very active. Ray was a big, strong, husky guy and didn't fear the devil. And so uh, he passed on too. And we had other fellows, the old classic type. With Charlie Patterson's block, and Fisher, and uh, oh man, uh, uh, hey, all oh, hey. Then we had a couple of boys, uh, I can't recall their names, they were brothers. One worked in the field mill, and one worked in one year, and one of the years. Inspector, and uh, they had better than average education in terms of the movement. So many of these names have escaped me at the time, but this is the type of person that had some previous experience in the labor movement and had the courage to go out. Now, soon has got his experience way back in the 20s when they were back in May to organize uh, the city of Muncie and the youth back in those They were beat out. So the result was that these two sent, I went over on the picket line at uh, 
where they had the set down. That's the guide land. This is old local 146 immigration post, South Florida, and the guide land to the general motor. And while I was there, my father was an old union harness maker too. And we both stopped there and we were on the picket line. We found our way over to the post town of Arcadia. We got interested in the picket line, so we went on the picket line. There I had two pounds of meat and had about a dollar and a half in my pocket. And I bought you about 15 papers. Cost a few ten cents a piece. Bring them back and put them on the plant. This is my dependent. January 36th, 37th. It was either December 36th or January 37th. I don't recall that. So the result was that we never did get back. We came back to Monkey after serving the same picket line with the boys inside the front fence gate, getting the plane with the people. And on Monday evening, last real cold winter, I think it Terrible for us to water me and everything else. We were still there tonight. So I take three or four of these tapes and put them inside my belt. And uh, I leave it in my clothing. And then I first go in where I make a point to pick out the people that I knew to be in the background and had got associated with some of my brother and I'd give them the papers so I got all sorts of things passed out. It took me about a week to get all passed out. What would happen to you in the car attack? Well, I don't really know. I don't think that Warner Gear would have fired me because I had been too vocal on behalf of the union and the And the recent uh, in 1934, when Mr. Harley got beat in the case for some of the old NRA, well, I don't think they would have fired me because I was a pretty good thing. I worked hard. And uh, uh, it, there was something about our people, even though we wanted to use, there was one thing that Warner Gear was most lucky. You never met a man who worked at Warner Gear back in the days, of the early days. And the day I went to work there, maybe before 1938, until I left there, that wasn't proud of the fact that working more in here and proud of his work. And this is what he was most proud of. Because we were transmission uh, special mechanics and everybody was proud of his work. So the result was uh, after we uh, got this done, I kept watching Carl Hart. And Carl background was one of a farmer when he was eighteen years old. He didn't get through school. And uh, uh, he went to work for Fort Wayne Cape at Carson City, Indiana. The name of the the result of it was he injured his arm. He got terrible treatment. His arm was put in for a couple of years. He wasn't able to work. He got nothing for him. So he finished it. But during this period of time, he had nothing to do. So he took his. Uh, uh, well, his brothers, younger than me, and took their school books and educated himself by a constant study and reading through the school books and uh, created a, 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 a desire on his part to further his education without instruction. He just had to work it out the hard way. And he developed himself into a man of tremendous insight and uh, a tenacity like a bulldog. He thought he was right, he would hang on. And so I kept watching Carl during this terrible bad month of February. And I noticed that uh, of an evening after work, they would come over to my restaurant. In the meantime, in January, I had purchased the restaurant across the more here plant too. And uh, struggling to make that go. I didn't have any money when I bought it. To pay down on it, but through a grocery from here in town who was friendly to me, uh, he turned it over to me and financed it so I was able to make it pay. But during this period of time, Carl would come in with Daddy May and a few others 
where they'd been meeting in Daddy May's garage and he'd ran across the railroad tracks. Some weren't there. They come in so cold their lips would be blue, they just be cold. Their ears would be blue almost. So I kept watching this happen for a few nights. Finally I decided that Carl was doing something I didn't know anything about. And so I went over to him, water time, I told him to make this little thing, I wiped my hands off. Went over to him, I said, hey Carl, guy in cars, Carl had an old red banana handkerchief from a yard square. He looked straight in the eye and said, Parkman rolled the handkerchief. There was the organization that shook her the first time I was in the end year. And that was then. In January and February of 1936. Well, <clears throat> during these intervals, the state police, the Division of Labor, and everything else, and General Motors, uh, was uh, being conducted to ask the union and pressures of all kinds, threats, and I don't know what all was going on. Well, this kind of quiet us down, but the determination was built. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And the guy that who never dreamed of being friendly to the idea of the labor movement had been set up to here in the gym in regards to some of the things. So the boss told you to be in there at 5 o'clock in the morning, you were there up to do that job. Even if that's before you're eight or tired. Yeah. yeah. And he come in and told you to work overtime, you worked overtime. Big guard. So he came in common and didn't have to wear the right off. And select few people. It wasn't rotated. It was select you that would uh, be required to do this. The ones that you had to take the least performance of our instruction. So you never knew what time how the lights came on up there. No, that's true. So then there would be spasmodic layoffs from time to time. And there's never any recall based upon seniority. And uh, oftentimes you find the guy uh, who hadn't been there too long gets a good job. And the guy's been there for years getting nothing. When the layoff time came, men who have been there 10, 15 years getting up a little year from age, they'd be laid off. And you're some guy like myself in 1928. I went in there. A year later, the layoff hit. There was a man beside me, 19 years serving the company, he taught me everything I knew. He was laid off and I was kept. That wasn't right. I knew it wasn't. But I was hungry too. I couldn't say lay me off because I had a couple of people. So all of us had a, a feeling to one another. And we had no voice in it. If you raise your voice, well then we might be put on the burn machine after this job is mine. We and so I cut up and that. Well, anyhow, <coughs> then the thing got really moving when they elected Cooney as the temporary chairman and uh, uh, several others. I can't recall all their names, but the Wilberton, as long as I live, even though I disagree with it finally on many things thereafter, to me, he was still the, the leader. I thought about the organization with the assistance of the Midnight Power Park and Merrill Stein and Louis Battle, Ralph Fisher, Paul Hale, many, many others. Wilbur Cook still living, you know? I don't know. He left the plant many years ago and went down into Florida, and I've never uh, seen him since then. Uh, uh, for me, although I disagreed with him when uh, this clip came, I wanted to stay with the CIO, he wanted to stay with Norman Martin, and uh, all else go independent, and I was kind of a of local at that time. He was president, and so the majority of the board stayed with me. And uh, so Walter Plaster just became very important to picture the picture of Hayes, along with uh, Ralph Fisher and Carl Parker. And we were, Carl Weisson, we were the elected delegates to the City Night Convention that uh, kept the UAW in the CIO. And uh, John Barty was a very important factor in this effort uh, because we all knew John. He helped us organize the Justice Auto Council, which is still known as Justice Auto Council, and just yesterday, 30 years later. 
So the result of it is that uh, this is not a complicated lot of leadership. We gave it leadership. We had no money at all to work, organize, rent a building, or anything like this. We had no money. Nobody had any money. So a great deal of money that uh, contributed by we worked in the shop and uh, my little reference to his uh, employee for the turned over to you and me. Uh, they were learning about that part of the game and I turned up in the headquarters. Yeah. And then they tried to go around me and uh, buy it off and run with me to a third party who was also a member of the union. The company tell you to buy my Well, uh, he, uh, we both suspected what was happening because he had no money. And later on, he was sued. He was sued. I don't want to name him. I don't know whether he's living or not. But everybody knows it's the district where he tried to get people to do I was prosecuted by the Department of Major Charge. And the result of this, the jury found him guilty of the conspiracy. And so the man he was working with, he believed he was a detective. And he was filed charge against him as well. And his name was Paul Hagee. And I'm proud of that. And so we uncovered him. And uh, uh, we always thought that he was one of the things.
that I was selected for was educational director of local street press. And uh, this is the funny thing about uh, the UNW local. That every new organization you know, has an educational grant. They recognize the value of getting someone to take this job and that's quite cheap to accept the union. Well, our first job was to learn how to act when we were out of the woods. And so the steward body, which met every Saturday, they allowed me 10, 15 minutes before the steward body to explain uh, the parliamentary procedure and we were out of the woods in order to keep our folks in the government job. And this was uh, it was a great help to the president of the local union because uh, if we hadn't had this place, we would have been trouble over the one season one. Of course, we did add a lot of that in. <laughs> so, then, the next thing I served on was delegates. Now, back in those days, delegates had to pay their own expenses. I guess that's why I got elected as delegate, <laughs> because my car was at the disposal of well, anybody for any union activity, wherever it was in the country. And we paid our own expenses, all that. The formation just got a problem. The formation was the state the other. Uh, council organization, and then I was elected to the job. Well, then I was elected finance secretary of the local union, and I refused to run and let the other people run the rest of the opposition ran against me. Because I don't think that, uh, and I still don't think that, it's good for acclimation of voters. I think that all should be a process to explain to people how to conduct themselves. Right to the democracy. Our union is still democratic in the sense of the word. Uh, so, then after being elected to the finance secretaryship in the West National Convention, there we placed the federal department in retaining the uh, OPEC, retaining the UAW into the uh, CIO organization. Uh, our local union did not. Paid any of the capital tax to either organization, and I would use the finance tax and finance secretary. Is that a pretty good job, financial secretary? Yeah, it was a free will offering, and which you, uh, you, uh, the value of the thing was that you got the cost of every man in the local union was the most important. So they could pay the dues in bank, they could pay the dues, and it comes, and it's a very valuable thing. Beginning days about you. And, uh, well, now, did you have difficulty holding your membership and uh, getting you paid your dues before you had to check off? Not in our local union, because in the very beginning, for those who did not pay the dues, the company used, you know, what I referred to before, there's about 400 of those people. And we would throw uh, a card check the gate of the entrance building. Didn't have the dues paid while you went up the office to work. Now, uh, we don't have to do that anymore. I'm glad. But was that legal? Well, let's say it was an necessity. All right. Okay. And uh, sometimes things are morally right, maybe not be just legally right, but these guys are taking everything with their hands out like that and uh, getting all the benefits we did. And this is the boxes we voted to use in, so we insisted. But they all come in. Well, anyhow, this helped us a lot. We were able to keep our heads above water financially. We uh, had, uh, instead of our people wanting to spend money from every direction, they were very, very conservative. Because a man working in shop back in those days, he had to be conservative in his wages and paid, so it's not to be held over and to be conservative to the activity. There's no great expense. Ralph Fisher carried the money this whole beginning of his first time, I think, right? Around his pocket. He had money in every pocket. And that man accounted for every dime. To me, this is a miracle that we were able to get. In fact, leadership we got in two. In fact, leadership we got in Ralph Fisher. In fact, leadership we got in Carl Parker, Carl Snyder, and various other fellows who were. Snyder still living, you know? I think he is. I'm not sure. Is Carl still living? But is he living in that? Yeah. To me, I think you have to talk to him, Danny, 
to get a further insight of the activities of that one particular group uh, in the Osprey days. Well, would it be a possibility of getting a picture of the group? Do you uh, have any idea if anyone has a picture of the original group? Who? I don't. I think I have pictures, but I'm not quite sure. I don't think I have pictures of all of them. But uh, Art John might have pictures. And Harold uh, Snyder may have pictures. I've got some pictures of them and uh, some of the other boys in the and things like that. And uh, I'd be interested in them. That'd be very strange. Anyhow, we went through the election, and we wouldn't have never been able to do what we did. It would have to been the hardcore group employees who had been members of the West of the Union and other groups So our nation not new to us, so it's the last of the We had it in 21, 22, 24. Well, when did you have your election? The, uh, whether or not they belong to local communities, that means they had to whether they belong to the country. And this was in May. 37. Huh? 37. May of 37. 37. I think it's somewhere around 34. It's just somewhere in there. I'm not sure. That's, that's quite all right. Now, uh, I have a question uh, relating to that. Uh, did the uh, company cooperate with you and with the uh, both the NLRB representatives? Who was your election? They held the election. Uh, was the company uh, hostile, or were they blocked? They well, tried to uh, discourage your uh, membership, or were they? Uh, did they take sort of a hands-off attitude? Well, I know it relates to my own personal experience. My partner, my, my uh, supervisor, boss, was an old union man. So one day he walked over to me and he said, "You want to go to the roof?" Are you with that kind of done the CIO organization? Again, I thought my time had come, so I wiped off my hands to wish for the rest. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, my friend, I don't want to call him the name because he's a close person. He was then, he is now, but our guy. I said, yes, I want to done it a little before. I never thought you would Yes, I never thought you would to take the position that it all was yes, right, and And so I understand that some of the boys were threatened by some of the uh, supervisors of the other clients. Wasn't there a secular form letter that went out to all the employees from uh, Texas? Yeah. What was the nature of the letter? I don't recall. I recall the letter being mailed out, and uh, I recall some of the company even representing the company's situation on the subject of the credit. But uh, we knew these guys as a whole tolerate these things because we knew that we had the majority. All right, now when you had your vote and you won an overwhelming majority, do you remember the attitude of the company where you automatically uh, accepted and recognized as a representative? Uh, all the workers are. Uh, we didn't have to go through any court time. We were have a conference table about it. Well, there's plenty of it. And sometimes it got to block. You know, a lot of the churches think that those who are speaking to the they kind of set aside their personal business sometimes. I think it's a personal business. Now, you know, another fellow told me that, he, well, I've had two stories. One fellow told me that he really didn't believe the company recognized the union as being here as a uh, bargaining agent for the employees for about 39. And in fact, 39. Someone else told me not to do until during the war. Well, of course, I guess it's according to uh, uh, I was an employee of the force. 
boy after the war. And uh, I would say that a, a passenger train, not knowing, because we had no uh, labor relations at that time, for the company. Now, what the man was referring to you in the war was the fact that during the World War Labor Board too, we had we had won a case, the company had gone in and hired the made man who had taken down against the company of labor relations for extra years and Gregory. And uh, this brought up a very serious attitude because the company thought they could get this guy to change the position, which he did. He ruled against his own decision. And I played on his own decision. Oh, he got hate Oh, yeah, he got a nice hate for him. And he killed his company as far as I'm concerned. I got the official rank of the company. He's board one in the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the result of it is that I would say that until the 39th strike, Warren Gear had not accepted the union, and then they had hardly accepted and probably the man is correct in the state of things that he managed uh, in 1945. And of course, to say that Warner Gear thought that the Union was a passing thing, uh, but it was the thought of all manufacturers. Yeah, they didn't accept the IRA, they didn't accept the Wagner Act until it was kind of validated by the in, like, uh, in 1937, the law became uh, effective, or became into effect. But they didn't recognize it until 1939 when the Supreme Court said it was constitutional. So, uh, and that affected their relationship with their employees? Yeah, no. All important. Yeah. I'd like to go back to the 1939 strike. Prior to that, they wanted to uh their customer was their biggest competitor. And we in the union knew that we had to make a better product of less so one of our customers is a Ford Motor Company. And a previous organizer named Ed Hall was in the year. He managed to sell his membership in the union at that time. And so he kind of got himself on the land of Ford Motor Company. Trying to negotiate contracts with some of their suppliers or people who didn't come to sell that to the switch. He said that he had shut more gear down. And the company said he couldn't do it. So that's why we got it on the table. So Carl Parker goes in and shut the plant down. He pulled the switch. So when he rolled on, it was a wild guy. So he just walked off the job. That's the only thing he did. And then in 1939, I would say that Warner Gear began to realize that they had some powerful leadership within the union. And when we started the plan, uh, we had no ticket. Our people had not been prepared for it. So we, we had to bring, we had to go outside our union, and the union uh, ticket that we had, and uh, I was sure to use the strike was called, and I was called Carl to come home immediately. And we were over there trying to organize the enemy to start this year. So the result was that when I came home, I got home by 125 that night, and my wife, was Joe Douglas, who was the only two people in the restaurant, there was no tickets on the gate, so I could see, and the reason I couldn't see him because it was all colored. We found we had finished the ticket for it. We had no tickets in our own group. And people didn't understand. Well, this brought us into a terrible thing within our union. But all everybody tried to uh, find themselves financially unprepared for it, regardless of whether they were going to strike or not. We just hit them out in cold heat sky, and it caused a very disruptive thing in our membership. We suffered from it for several years. But the union had to get time together and find the need that the guys were released or not. And so I think this is the beginning of the realization that Warren Gear had a wildcat with a tail. The management had a wildcat with a tail and they didn't have to do this again. So then they began to prepare themselves by uh, making things a little tougher and tougher. So finally 
and got Gregory. We still were able to develop it to a site. Uh, and we very friendly on the site. Happy to call all of them. And so I'm not trying to glorify any individual. And uh, we had a big line at that time. And the farm community was going around. We had no site benefit. And the farm was playing in the street. So maybe things like this. How long was the site in the city? I don't recall. I think it's how long was it? Was it was four. I don't know. I wouldn't want to say. Depends if I was on that. Uh, let me interrupt a little. We're running out of tape on this side, and I'll flip it, and then I want to come back to this. And I think that the uh, the farmers were willing to contribute to and accept for the work in this side of the federal union over the county. And I also want to ask you some uh, related questions about other uh, regions. Uh, Following is the second half of a taped interview with Mr. John Barkey from the International Union United Automobile Workers and Mr. Lou Leonard, a retired representative of the United Automobile Workers and also a former leader and founder of Local 287. At the uh, close of the first half of the tape, uh, Mr. Leonard, you were telling us about the strike in 1939 and about the fact that farmers uh, came in and offered uh, material support. Uh, to the workers of Warner Gear. Uh, I'd like to ask you also if you had between 1934, 35, and especially 37 and 39 during the critical uh, periods of organization, if you did have the support of other community uh, interests, or uh, did you have the action, uh, opposition of certain uh, what we might call interest groups in the community during those periods? In our formation period, we had the opposition, I suppose, especially the early organized groups, including the Many of them in the association and so forth and so on. What did they do specifically? Well, in the 1939 strike, uh, the Metro Association, they could do something about the strike situation. We think they were part of the education so some of us met with them, and that was a business And uh, this was just up with the council. Well, we had a friendly minister who was secretary of the Minnesota Association at that time, but then the Reverend Hall, the Methodist, the years of the Southwest Party Council. And he was a very serious fellow, and his countries were with the poor and the needy. And uh, so, uh, Ray Reverend and I went out to see him and talked with him. He told us that it was a part of the program. Uh, it was very complimentary to the Minister of Food that uh, what some of the activities were going to be. So we were able to have the identity of the Minister of Food and Food. However, there was a couple of hundreds of flats in between. And the still employed Warren here as a whole were. Uh, a church going people. And so the leadership of the union at that time requested that all of us that uh, we had church affiliation would go to churches and uh, with our union badge and our coat and conduct ourselves properly. Well, we had one particular manufacturer who was superintendent by one of our clients and uh, he was particularly anti union. And so uh, about 35 of us selected his church to go to, and we sat down and we engaged in the negotiation. And of course, when we arrived there, we got to the uh, church, so we had to take the same thing. We sat there, with very casually, with the message of the morning, and we had our training. And I think that the other members of our church, we would have been to their second church. At that time, I'm causing the school associates to take a little different look and attitude about this thing because they realized 
main problem arose uh, in 39, the resulting from the 39 strike, that uh, they had uh, some problems arising there because there were a number of people who found themselves together for that kind of for several years. Uh, they would not have found any reason to get an election of office or anything like that. Uh, they would be there as well. And we let people who were soft in the meaning of them or uh, more militant and aggressive persons were not elected. But there's so nothing to find. Once you elect these people, they become more aggressive and rightly organized. They organize the movement. And they got their eyes open. So when Warren uh, Garrison has realized some of these things uh, later on, and this is carried on now, most of those people are gone from land, laid off, or uh, retired, or died, or uh, quit. So today you have a new group. I suppose we have a group in our plan today where I want to see that I have been in the plan for several years, but I'm guessing it will be under uh, 40 years of age, or around 40 years of age, probably. And uh, so they had no conception of what some of the things were at the time. Our political activities have been one of the strongholds uh, of our community and on behalf of our union. We have been able to elect people at one time in uh, 1940. We elected Andrew Chandler to the state legislature. Do you remember what we were doing? Do you local 459? And he had a whole fun air about him that caused people to question what party they were on. He, uh, at the time, he organized our uh, uh, union, but uh, uh, none of us had any party association. We were just rude with our people because he's done so many things for us. Now, uh, before that time, some of these people had been Republicans and some of them had Oh, yeah. Well, the class was served on the Republican City Council here under Mayor Hampton in 1929, I believe, when the mayor was a young mayor elected to the public office of the state of Indiana. He was a Republican. But rather than, uh, in 1940, we elected Andy to the legislature, and he got more votes than President Roosevelt uh, 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 got. He got more votes than Henry Stricker, a candidate for governor got, and he got more votes than uh, the United States Senate candidate. He wrote the ticket of all offices. And uh, this is just uh, where the union, uh, I suppose it's the first time, it really put together in a critical time. Now, do the local unions in the community work together as a group? I know uh, Mr. Barkey is that a while ago that. Uh, or you said, I believe, that Mr. Barkey was one of the people who came in and organized a CIO council for your time. Can you give about 15 40? Yeah. Yeah. Now, is this council still in operation? Yeah. It is operating as a uh, CIO council. The United Automobile Workers are not, I do not know whether they are disaffiliated on a local level or not, but I assume that they have. But the council is, uh, they got a better leadership. Uh, had back in those days, uh, and uh, as far as that field, it has more money to work with. It's very concerned, I mean, I agree with all of them, but in and out, it's what I have to say, it's better than it used to have. Now, in the 39 program, we had uh, two very important persons, three very important persons, who came to the city and went through from time to time at our request and helped us organize other plants and helped us organize ourselves. And these are two, the two first two men I want to call is Martin Miller, who is a legislative champion. I'm a Republican, registered Republican, uh, representing the chairman and all the legislative activities. And the other one is Howard Short, who is legislative chairman of the railroad engineer. Now, John Barkey got us acquainted with these people. Well, you have had in an office for the Then, Governor Thompson was the governor. And they set up a division of labor. And the first division of labor was an old player of the union man by the name of Tom Hudson, who served in that capacity under about two or three different governors. And the result of it is that these men came in and helped steer us into the direction that our uh, unions were born of legislation and the legislation that was taken away and the legislation that was put in the activities 
I was judge of the board. Uh, was he uh, also frequent. a young uh, active member of the committee at one time? He always followed his father very closely. Uh -huh. And uh, he was active in the union. Yeah, I find no fault with him. I think he's uh, I'm going to interview you now. I don't know if you know this now, but he uh, has been promoted to superintendent in 1922. Well, Eddie Davis is one of our people, and I don't know who later on became a superintendent. Uh, Eddie Davis was one of your I didn't know that. Yeah, Eddie Davis was, uh, I, he was on my line, an old plant. Uh, He's still living, you know? Uh, I don't recall. I don't know. I know he and his wife uh, very well. They were members of the Baptist Church here. And, and uh, of course, uh, when the project was born, I gave him our baby page. And we were good friends. And, uh, so Eddie was a good leader. Uh, on my line and talked to me a lot of things about cutting years. And I want to tell you that at that time we came to the uh, year cutting cheese repairment. We went from now on up, we went on up. And I've always had great deal of respect for him. That was a good man, I asked for all of us. Well, I think the biggest help that when you've been organized labor camp for one of here is that. We've been able, able to raise our wages so when we could buy automobiles, and your product goes into automobiles. And Paul Hoffman, the president of Studebaker Company, is such the best I've ever heard. He said, well, we're going to sell automobiles. You can pull it to make money. And so we are making money. Production has just increased more than double since uh, our, our union came in. What did you fellas do, buy Ford? Is that why I got No, no. We had a policy of Studebakers are buying Studebakers. Uh, and I never bought anything but a Studebaker from 1936 until they went out of business. Uh, I might add here that at various times when our bargaining committee was confronted with uh, our company across the bargaining table stated that, well, our competitors are not organized. Uh -huh. And if you recall, I, read, I, I uh, mentioned uh, Syracuse, New York, Tony Hennigan, and it's not that here. Well, under the pressure of the company, we realized we had to go out and organize the other makers of automobile transmissions and products that we manufactured. So our competitive shop department, which I was a local delegate to the National Competitive Shop Department, and we say, Warren Gear, I suppose put more pressure on to organize this department, the Warren Gear Local 287, and which we followed through. So we were able to organize a number of the competitors in a much quicker way because the company was trying to do us all the time. They couldn't do this unless they could They were and free. Well, then, uh, another time, I recall, not too many years ago, when the transmission plant was building down at uh, Cincinnati by Ford, we had always had a, a, a sizable percentage of Ford's transmission equipment to change over to the Model A. Well, the result was that uh, I think Jack Reed was president of the local union at that time, and he called me. And uh, so we had uh, about losing the business. And so we got the international union and uh, the local committee, and along with other people. I'm not sure what all the results were, but I do know that many times local union on its own went out and tried to help one of your corporations by organizing its competitors and putting them in the wage structures that would be permitted. Uh, and also by trying to attract more business to one another. I think that, yes, I think the biggest thing that's been beneficial to Warner Gear, and if it's beneficial to Warner Gear, it's beneficial to the whole community. And that has been the feeling of security from agreements within the contract that left the business element of the town to carry in the stories on the shelves, left them to have sales and competition with the other surrounding communities, and let them be able to move merchandise. Uh, I think that we help want to do that way and want to do help the town. Okay? Right? So I think that the other thing, uh, I don't believe there's any work there for one year, at least I have never known any. I was accepted proud of my work, my ability to perform my work. And I think this is something that Dr. Nagy and do any honest business can to be a good worker and produce his work that he wants out of his compensation for. And if you don't get it, he's going to make darn sure he's going to get it because he knows that he's going to help him. So I think he helps the community and the children, and I think the company will be.
uh, has recognized the fact that many of our people, the provision of the company today, are people who were the first responsibility is trained as a person who has been Has there ever been a European in the, uh, uh, between the uh, all of the economic philosophy of the labor union and uh, born again? Uh, has there ever been any uh, strong uh, uh, interest on the part of the workers to uh, control management, take over the factory, uh, to establish your own political party? You mentioned a while ago that uh, one of your uh, bosses asked you one time if you were a member of that radical communist organization. Not that John L. Lewis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is there well, any basis for that kind of thinking about working people and labor union people? The unions don't want to take over anything. And I think the success is amplified by the company's protection. They're right. We have protected you. That's the only way. Hire whoever you want to. After their 90, their 90 days of probationary period, then they become a member of the union. And during this period of time, you make up your mind whether this is the type of congenial fellow or this type of skill that man can add or what he can be trained. But by gosh, you're going to treat him after the 91st day as one of the members of the human race. I think this is uh, a, a proof enough that the union don't want to run the company. I think this is proof. Would you like to see the government? I'm not asking you know, a personal philosophical question. Uh, do you think uh, the majority of the union members have ever felt that it'd be better if the company uh, was owned and operated either by themselves or by the government, or by free enterprise? That's the last thing the United Automobile will be on. Now, there may be some unions who want that, but the United Automobile workers don't want that. Do you agree with that, John? As a representative? Well, I've never heard any any uh, talk of uh, wanting to take over industry or uh, have the government taken over. You know, European writers uh, can't understand uh, the philosophy of the American trade unionists, and uh, many American uh, writers do uh, perhaps uh, uh, do uh, very little active talking with union representatives that I'm doing now. Uh, have the opinion that the uh, labor union movement is somehow subversive in origin and in the attitude and orientation and so forth. And uh, I don't agree with that. I agree with you both entirely because uh, that's the way it looks to me. I say labor history from the very inception. And it seems to me the American labor movement is probably just about as uh, devoted to the free enterprise system as uh, uh, Henry Ford was. It's just a matter of uh, how you divide the pie. The point here is. This country has become good because of its constitution, because of the rights and protected rights of people. And when those people have not been protected through the union or through the law, then the union becomes the vehicle in which it exposes it. Now, we don't want to take away man's rights. We don't want to take away the right of the political party. But we're only saying to them, we want our share. We don't want to do it as anti capital or anti-Republican or anti-Democrat because we got everything in our union. We got everything. Now, did you have an attempt on the part of the uh, Communist Party yes. to the union? Yes. Don't tell us a little about that. Well, the uh, the Communist Party worked very closely. Uh, the fact that you're local, didn't he? Not, no, not in my local. No, we never had any communists. Oh, no, you were, you were in two days. No. Yeah. But they, the communists did work pretty close with us in, uh, in our political action and in our organizational days. It appears we were the only ones that had nerve to get out the front. In, in uh, this town strike in Flint, they were pretty close. And uh, they, they were the ones, as I said, who seemed to have a better sister neck out. Uh, politically, during the 1938 campaign, I guess it was, we, uh, we sat down together, all of us, the unions and the Communist Party and like, and worked out who was going to run for office, both of his money, as a farmer labor party in St. Louis County. And uh, uh, we did work with them. But then, of course, we found out that their, uh, their uh, end was not the end that we were seeking. They right. were being controlled always by by, uh, by some some uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah, uh, some foreign government. Yeah, uh, right. Put it up their orders down. And we we wanted to take our orders and follow the leadership of unions. 
the dog would be coming, and uh, Lord I think he was coming to fight it. So we just kicked them out of the CIOs, you know, the communist union, but we couldn't bring over to, to the uh, union thinking. Well, well, why did they kick them out? Well, because they were communist dominated, and because we couldn't do anything with them. We couldn't get them to give up that leadership that they had at that time. Which was not a native leadership. That's right. The food and tobacco workers were flying. The uh, United Nations Corps was another one. The Italian equipment workers was another one. Now, we have completely put them all, with the exception of the, uh, the uh, uh, UE, that's the United Nations Corps. They have a few local unions left in general electric. What do they have left uh, the U.S. Indian hands if they had dominated? I, I, I think they would have uh, led it in the direction of eventually taking over the government and taking and uh, then nationalizing industry. I think there's no question what they were now. I started to say a minute ago, in all my time as an international representative, I have never had to I have always advocated that employees of the company ought to be loyal to that company. That you could be totally good union member and be loyal to the company. I don't think she'd have been a little more loyal than employees than I. In 1943, when I was working back in the factory, the personnel department was scared of me, you know, they thought I was an animal from organized life, and then they came. So they asked the general production manager of Plant One that built the body, uh, if you want to be back over there, he said, I'll see you do so we got a lot more like it. And I, I was always a good employee, and I wasn't, I, I wasn't raising pain all the time. I just wanted justice. I wanted what Mr. Josephine Rose said at our first organization convention of the C.R. Pittsburgh in 1937, when she said that in a sense, only as industrial democracy is assured can political democracy continue to survive. Now, through our union, we have something about politics as well as uh, wages and working conditions for factories. And uh, as a result of having something to say about politics, our legislation has is, is been tremendous. We have seen a lot of legislation. A workman's compensation. When I was elected secretary of the state, I was fifteen dollars a week. Now it's fifty one. I think it's even fifty four now since the last session of the legislature. Unemployment insurance we didn't have. Uh, Social Security we didn't have. Wage our law we didn't have. We gained all of these things and was that the Trump to it. The National Labor Relations Board, before that, before the National Labor Relations Act, before it was enacted and was declared constitution by the Supreme Court, we had the strike for recognition. And if we had the strike, then we would come to the police department and go to our union. And so it was a war in order to get the recognition before the National Labor Relations Act. Now it's a question of a, a, an election conducted by the government, and if we win the fighting rights, they're really bound by law to bargain with us, and uh, that's, that's the way things ought to be done. All right, now, John, uh, I'm, I'm 25 years old, and I don't know anything about labor unions, and I go to work this morning here, and I have all these things, and it's really a silver platter. I have uh, retirement benefits, I have uh, uh, seniority rights, I have high wages, I have insurance, I have paid vacations. Um, I'm not uh, aware at all of the struggle that went on back in the 1930s, 40s, and these fellows were out on the brakes and they gave me these concessions from the company across the bargaining table. Now, uh, why should I be interested in uh, union membership? Why should I pay my dues? Uh, why should I... Uh, be willing to make sacrifices? Or why should I uh, uh, be an advocate of labor union organizations in the factory? Uh, how are you going to sell your ideas to the fellows uh, who inherited the benefits that you gained back in the 30s and 40s? Well, we realize that in the past we've had a hard job in this. Now, at our last convention, we raised the initiation fee from $5 to $10 minimum. And the extra $5 it's going to stay in the local union, and they're going to use that $5 of, uh, of putting these jury into the hands of these young people to show them how they were doing these things that they have today. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be helpful. Now, it, it is a little hard uh, when someone comes in the factory and uh, uh, they they make this reasonably good money and, uh, and uh, have these fringe benefits to get them to come to the union meeting. Uh, we, we there have a little opinion as, uh, as to how to give them community. We'll charge them an extra dollar due per month and then give them back that dollar 
uh, if they come to the Union. Now, this isn't the business universally in the world of you. This is many of our local unions. And uh, uh, just, uh, just uh, last week, we negotiated a union shop at Greensburg, and about 50% of them didn't belong to the union. Well, some of them were pretty upset about it, and they found out that they didn't belong to the union. But uh, they came to the union meeting Saturday, and one of those people who was raising came was nominated and accepted a position in the union. Uh, after I talked to them, well, I said, the meeting Saturday, it's one of them that's just never been any other way found. But what does to have an effective say in the way in the world condition? I live in two million. That they tried to live to me, that they tried to jump me in. No way found in all history except through the union. Uh, these people, of course, seem to accept the union cup. The uh, fact that they were going to be uh, compelled if they didn't do so before the deadline to join the union and the willing to take position in the union uh, to help out. Did you ever come to Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, our membership is growing. An example. Uh, and, and the fact is, we're organizing locals so fast that we are having a hard time of keeping up with negotiating the new contracts and servicing those local units in, in Kentucky. That's part of our region. And number three, Indiana and Kentucky is our region. Uh, they, they're, they're winning elections down there, just one run us to another. They're doing the same thing in Indiana. Practically, all that you is. is find time to organize a group of workers uh, or to start the organizational guide and the plan and, and you win the election and then of course you have to serve them. Let me give you this example, John. Bubbleville and the out of town and county county seat. We had one union in that place in 1940 which I helped organize with the, uh, the rubber workers. And the result of it is there's been a foundry and several other little plants there. So I finally persuaded the International Organizing Department to go in and organize a plan. We've had these games. We had one, you know, every election. We won it. This is where the franchise. This is where the Pelly organization was headquartered. And this is where no Democrat, only one or two Democrats been elected there since the Civil War. The one party system, socially and every other way. I live in, in Arcadia, Hampton County. The reason I love it is, in the last three, four months, we have organized the one for the NLRB election. The next one come over by a card check off for the Division of Labor. And the next one came over, Warren, Warren and Body Company. That says, okay, you got the membership, you'll recognize the union. Now, <clears throat> this was unheard of even two years ago because of the political influences of that community and the church influence of the Quaker church and so forth and so on, which is anti-union. So this is what happened in the out of the way places that we have had time to get to. Now they're requesting it, and we have a wonderful group of organizers there who, who are conducting themselves in a proper way. So the pitchfork is not there when we get organized anymore. The record's there. The record of good wages, the record of vacation, hospitalization, retirement, fully paid benefits, health care, these seem to be the prevailing things that's guiding these problems. Say, look, I've got to work here the rest of my life, therefore, I should have some protection against the day I'm too old to work too young to die. Well, what are your goals in the future? Just, uh, maintaining what you already have achieved in the way of economic uh, successes? Uh, or do you have some uh, other goals that uh, will appeal to the young people? We seem to come up with new goals every contract. Uh, one, of the, one of the goals I would like to see is double vacation. Because when a worker goes on vacation, he's expected to go right on at home. And he then needs money to go on a vacation. And certainly a worker needs to go on a vacation to rest his body and mind because that would be a good employee for the next year. I want to so ask he's in too. trouble. He's in trouble if you don't get double vacation pay or, or a different pay. Vacation control. pay cannot really be used for both things. That's right. Both to keep his expenses by at home and also to pay for a vacation. Now, I want a compulsory vacation. I want a compulsory Hey, this helps solve some of the unemployment problems of the youth getting out of the school to confine work during the summer months 
to probably help his, his further education by doing him, filling in his job and say, and when you get this up, the vacation period is from May to the first Monday of September, say, so in the average place. Now, I want to point out one other thing our union is doing that should be of tremendous interest to you as an educator. What is the project up in Michigan that we have now? Black Road. We have a facility up there out of this world being developed to where people within a day's ride from any portion of Indiana can go to the Black Road, take their entire family with them. The guy goes to school four hours a day. They have facilities there for the young, the nursery for the young, for the age, for the tiny babies, the teenagers, programs of one kind of recreation, all this. And apparently the wife gets up there and she can go to school if she wants to, or she can go into home economics uh, classes and things of this sort, or all types of programs of this kind, so where the guy can go on his vacation and he be paid for it. Sounds quite interesting. Now, he's being paid for it because the cost of it is so small. And so this is one of the programs, uh, getting a, the program of the union into the places where it really counts. The wife, you know, she never, the young wife, doesn't know anything about the older wife. Because today she can get tickets out of a can, and uh, in the old days we had to make them out of clatter milk. And so a lot of the things that the old way of doing it. I've found young women that don't know what the hell a simple is. They, and I've got some real old fashioned ones that I show them when I'm just explaining these things to them. So the result of it is, Danny, what are objectives, goals, economic goals of the future? I think you'll find earlier pension of a guy out of the shop. Because the company, it seems to me like, will go along with this because they can train the young man's mind to the, uh, to the uh, age, uh, electronic age, that they can't train the older person. And so we're going to find gains made there. We're going to find it particularly in health care. We're going to find it in, in keeping abreast of the wage structure, not accepted, but to keep abreast of those little things. I think that you're going to find the unions with a program of taxes down the political front to expose dastardly. Uh, 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 such, this is one of the biggest things that retiree has, and there's also a young man buying the home. Right. Okay. These are some of the things that I think are being done. Well, 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 can we look forward then to seeing uh, local, local 2 and 7 and the UAW in general becoming more politically conscious, more politically active? Do uh, you think, uh, John? Yes, I'm sure we will. Uh, our whole PEP program, that's Community Action Program, uh, is geared to take to to urging and encouraging our people to take part in community activities, to take part in politics locally on the state level and on the national level. And what was this organization set up? The, our CAP program was set up because we've had we've had our labor non partisan league from nineteen and thirty eight. That was that was our first <coughs> political action. Well, has it really been non partisan though, John? Uh, yes. So oh, yes. Yes. On both parties. Yes, so. it's, uh, it is. Uh, okay, yes. I, I am one who who uh, is not prejudiced against the a Republican. I'm a Democrat because it happens that most of the good liberal people have been in the Democratic Party. But I have said many times, because of this this opinion of most people that we're just Democrats. If I could find a good Republican, I'd be happy to support it to get the Democratic little off my back. Have you ever supported him? Yes. 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 I have. Yes, I, I have supported our, our present congressman, my president, Bill Bray. I wouldn't do it now because Bill Bray votes 99% uh, uh, for the American conservative action. But he used to vote reasonably liberal when he was in the Senate district. Now that he's been changed to where he's in the district, it takes him my area in Indianapolis. The reason of that is, is because the reason that people are voting Democratic, the old man is voting Democratic, is not because he wants to. The, the political parties have divided themselves. One is the conservative and stands still, the other is moving forward. Based upon the platform, as well as the personalities involved, and that personality has a record. And so it's the record that sets folks the way we do and nothing else. Right, there are some people, though, in the Republican Party, uh, doesn't the Republican Party have a liberal wing? Yes, but, but they're, they're not in Indiana. Yeah. 
Maybe the the other thing that I think that has is detrimental to the minority right is the fact that I'm speaking for the age group that I'm in, and I think I can also speak for a portion of the older worker that's presently working in the shop. He's, re he's dumbfounded at the destruction of practice. He's dumbfounded with the college students to where now he's beginning to react against. You know, we were protesters in 37. The difference between we and the protesters in 37, we had justice on our side, and maybe the protesters, they had justice. But we knew where we were going. The guy today, I don't think, and I think the greater number of people don't know where he thinks he's going. They don't know where he's going. We had a program, and our program's in effect to the benefit of this entire nation and the world today in our union. But ask the young college student what his program is. He will establish a program after we take over. That's what Hitler did. Now, the American trade union movement is more American than the Chamber of Commerce, in my opinion. The person who is sitting out here in the small towns where they've been forced to go because of living costs, without leadership, he's in the quandary. He wants to go. We have the opportunity now to get it. But if we wait past 1972, we'll never get it. That's all I got to say, Danny, and I appreciate being here very, very, very much. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. You've both been extremely helpful, and I'm quite sure that uh, this is going to be one of the most valuable tapes that I have in the entire collection. And uh, you, you're very uh, gracious and very well informed and uh, very uh, articulate gentlemen. Again, thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.